West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Why, if they know these things, why, if Mark Zuckerberg knows these things, have they not corrected them? You know, talking to a lot of current and former employees, there is a strong sense that this is Mark Zuckerberg's company and that he really, truly does love the product, like thinks that Facebook should be kind of everything to everyone. And I think that's kind of led to a approach where the focus has been on growth and the focus has been on increasing usage and whether or not that usage was safe or whether they had um, say the automated systems to help police things that might be dangerous in certain countries that are at risk of ethnic bloodshed those questions were sort of set aside um, and the company just went ahead and grew so if Mark Zuckerberg were running an airline, all he would care about is growing and he would have airplanes that were not well maintained and he would just have plane crashes all the time as part of doing business. Um, I think I can say having run through as many of the documents as I have and spent as much time with them that it is Facebook is a very they are innovative. They do a lot of really interesting things. They build a lot of neat things, but maintaining them isn't necessarily a strength. So it's probably for the best this isn't an airline. Yeah, uh, why does Zuckerberg go to work every day? What, is, what does he want now? He, he made turned his little college project into an enormous and worldwide important company. He's got $120 billion or something like that. Uh, uh, is, it, is it the money? Is He's not doing anything particularly interesting. He's not one of those guys who's got rockets going into space and riding into space himself. Uh, he's not creating new products uh, the way Elon Musk does. What is it? What, what does he go to work for? I think it seems like Mark actually does. He's not going into space. And he's not building electric cars, but I think the focus right now at the company, it has been for a few years, has been on two things. One is just sort of maintaining the company and its existing products, but even more so now the metaverse, which is kind of the, the grand label for uh, virtual reality um, that Facebook is working on right now. And that really seems to be where his interest in his heart is at the moment. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that you know, even as the company faces as much public scrutiny as it does at the moment, they really do seem, Mark personally seems much more interested in the metaverse and in uh, Facebook's work on that stuff than he does in the, say, real world that Facebook lives in. Let me, uh, before you go, uh, what would it take to get uh, Facebook to be good on the maintenance, as we call it? I think a lot of it is transparency and a lot of it is also simplicity. Facebook um, has just continued to build things. The number of recommendation systems alone inside the company, it's scores. I had the number somewhere, but 
they um, simply, it's not the size of Facebook, it's the complexity of it that seems like it's causing them problems. And to some degree, it is the willingness to keep pushing things forward, even when they don't necessarily understand the context or even the mechanics fully of the product. So I would say simplicity is, according to the employees that I've spoken to, maybe the biggest thing they could do. Jeff Horitz, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize is in the mail, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much for your reporting. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And Senator Amy Klobuchar questioned Francis Hagen in a Senate hearing three weeks ago. You said that Facebook implemented safeguards to reduce misinformation ahead of the 2020 election, but turned off those safeguards right after the election. Um, and you know that the insurrection occurred January 6th. Do you think that Facebook turned off the safeguards because they were costing the company money, because it was reducing profits? Facebook changed those safety defaults in the run-up to the election because they knew they were dangerous. And because they wanted that growth back, they wanted the acceleration of the platform back after the election, they, re they returned to their original defaults. And the fact that they had to, to break the glass on January 6th and turn them back on I think that's deeply problematic. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. Thank you very much for joining us, Senator. I, I, I got to say, uh, it, this this situation is just crazy. This is this is um, this is an extremely dangerous product that can be a safe product, just like air travel. Air travel's extremely dangerous if you just don't do the maintenance. Well, I love the way Mr. Horowitz described this as a company that just kept going day after day. How can we make more money? How can we get more people hooked? How can we expand the content? And pretty soon they realize, hey, the more angry content, the more people will read it, and then we can target them with ads and make more money. It was basically that straightforward. But as he described, unraveling it and putting some safeguards on it for the rest of us is not so easy. And I would start with this. Um, we simply have done nothing in Washington. I've been crying for this, calling for it for years now. We must have a federal privacy law. And we are working on that in the Commerce Committee under Senator Cantwell's leadership. We have to get that done. So people, when people are asked, do I want my data to be used? A lot of them say no, Apple knew that. They just asked, 75% of their customers decided they didn't want to share their data. Number two, more stuff on kids expanding the child privacy rules that are already in place, the law. Number three, uh, doing something about the algorithms that was pointed out by Mr. Horowitz, making it more transparent what's happening, and then competition policy. And finally, making them liable for things uh, when there is hate speech and when there's violence and misinformation in the middle of a public health crisis. He's clearly, Mark Zuckerberg himself said he was on a pretty much a no apology tour, I believe, a few weeks back. I don't know if that's where he still is. Um, but the point is, um, is that I don't think they're going to get there on their own. Well, they absolutely are not. I mean, that, that's what the, the what, what the Wall Street Journal's reporting has proven here from inside the company is that Zuckerberg knows he knows everything and he, does. he doesn't care. He does not care. No. He's not going to do anything to uh, exactly. do anything to make this product safer for people to use. And whether he intended to have it be unsafe from the beginning, it's really not as relevant to me anymore. What's relevant is that it isn't safe and that they're gonna continue doing this until we start passing some laws. You can have 20% of the economy be tech and then not having passed any privacy laws on the federal level, no changes to competition policy, uh, which I've long been uh, requesting, wrote a book about it, have a major bill I just put out, um, bipartisan bill on how to stop self-preferencing and some of the other crap that goes on uh, when people are trying to gain a competitive edge. I think people need to stop listening to the over 300 tech lobbyists that are crawling around these halls where I am right now and start listening to the moms and dads in their own state who will tell you that they are desperately trying to figure out how to protect their kids. And one way you do it with rules, the other way you do it is by allowing competitors in the marketplace and not letting Facebook buy everything so that you can have competitors that perhaps would have more safeguards for misinformation or protect kids more. That just isn't happening right now.
Uh, Mark Zuckerberg said tonight that the Wall Street Journal's reporting and Francis Hogan's whistleblowing and supplying thousands upon thousands upon, upon thousands of pages of data and information. Uh, what he says about that is what we are seeing is a coordinated effort to selectively leak uh, documents to paint a false picture of our company. What is your reaction to that? You know, I heard that tonight and I thought, OK, uh, first of all, I didn't even know this information was coming out. I was going on my own on this uh, for years, trying to put in some rules of the road. I've talked on your show about it for political ads, trying to do something about all of the hate speech uh, that was part of what led. And that's what the documents showed today uh, on January 6th, the fact that they weren't doing anything. He claimed that they limited 96 percent of hate speech. His own researchers saying it was only 5 percent. Um, so what this is, is the truth is coming out. At some point, the truth was going to come out. And then the question is, what do you do about it? And that's what I'm asking my colleagues. We're going to have another hearing on other platforms tomorrow in the Commerce Committee, um, and we will move forward from there. But we have to get something done now, Lawrence. It is Tuesday, the 26th of October of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash. Mm -hmm. A mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. I should also uh, uh, inform you, yes, inform, that there is roasted corn in the chowder. That's what we do here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, at least in the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy salon part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Yes. Well, how are you? It is Tuesday. We've endured a Monday beginning of the week and what's still considered the beginning of the week now isn't it indeed should uh clear up a few things on the table uh yesterday we had some reportage about erdogan from turkey or of turkey about ready to kick out 10 ambassadors including the u.s envoy over a row about uh essentially I don't know, giving credibility to a critic of Erdogan. And uh, that decision to kick out those 10 diplomats, including the U.S. envoy, has been rescinded. So uh, who knows? Maybe somebody gave uh, Erdogan a talk or two. I don't know. You give that guy a talk, I'm sure that it might stiffen his resolve uh, to be even more of an authoritarian, because that's exactly what he is. But he may have determined that, uh, you know, holding on to that EU status might, uh, he might need it. Just might need it. Indeed, he will. <laughs> the only question is, will he change his ways, or will somehow a more, uh, shall we say, democratic leader supplant Erdogan at some point. And let's hope it's soon. Uh, some bad news out of France. If you're, uh, if you're an advocate of a free society without a bunch of Nazis running the show, because there's not really much of a free society when the Nazis run the show. It seems the right wing and not just Marine Le Pen, but those right wingers even more virulent than Marine Le Pen. In in the uh, pantheon of right wingers in France, Marine Le Pen is now considered to be the elder statesman and the rational one. That's how scary it is. Well, the right wing extremist at all uh, seem to have made not just inroads. They've had inroads for quite a while, but they seem to have solidified even more support across the country. And uh, that does not bode well. It does not bode well one bit. Not one. So there. Okay. Uh, we got enough going on in this country, huh? Hey, we had uh, this uh, atmospheric river and cyclone bomb. I like that, a cyclone bomb. Boy, 
There was some uh, big time wins in the Bay Area. I've been on that Richmond Bridge many a time. And uh, that looks scary. I thought that truck was going to go, the, the trailer of the truck was going to get blown right over the railing into the bay. And that's a pretty far drop right there. Ooh. And uh, if it doesn't come uncoupled, it's, it's pulling the tractor back with it. Yep. But I think uh, if you'd seen that video of this truck being blown over by heavy winds uh, on the Richmond Bridge, looked to me like they were going from the East Bay to Marin. Um, I might be mistaken, but that's what it looks like. Uh, because there's a long transom of bridge lower to the bay and where the cantilevered iron part is, is closer to Richmond. Um, but uh, if you had seen the video, you would have noticed a fairly sized utility truck right next to the semi. And as the semi's trailer was getting blown and jackknifed, that truck sort of was in the way. And I believe that that's what held it up from getting blown all the way into the bay. My God. That looks scary. Okay, and I've been on that bridge many, many, many times, as I just said. on With some heavy winds, too, because it can blow. There, there, there's a little isthmus going right up there to Vallejo and elsewhere. Yeah, Benicia. All right. Um, let's see. What else? Um, oh, dare I speak about the uh, the terrible prop gun shooting on the movie set. I think this is also more of a story of why you need unions. And you don't really want scabs working for you. And uh, maybe maybe that should be considered in the future, too. Not saying that this particular uh, prop guy or A.D., who had been fired from uh, other sets before for being, I, I, I think the term is incompetent. Um, who I, I don't know. Is this some sort of nepotism thing? How, how, how do people keep getting hired? <laughs> Jeez, maybe I should. No, I'm too old now. You know, my movie days, I believe, are over. Yep. You hold on to a dream. First you get into it and you go, I'm better than this. And then uh, a few years go by and you go, oh, what, what? <laughs> anyway, I don't think I'm going to get a career in Hollywood because I know how it works. At this point, if I want to try to get a screenplay even considered, I have to have a, like a young beard. Somebody who's young to pretty much be me in public when they pitch the thing. Because they don't like old people. In Hollywood. Trust me. I know. <laughs> and when I say old, that's anybody over the age of 32. Okay? You're pretty damn old if you're 32 in Hollywood. So it's amazing when you see people in their 40s. Wow, that's so old. <laughs> My God. Yeah, I guess. Anyway, um, the... There was a picture that some one of the crew members had taken a picture of the table in which the armory props were just askew, you know, things in a bag and sticking out of a bag and and holsters with with uh, guns. And it was just haphazard. Uh, so someone goes there and just grabs something off the table. And then you don't clear the gun. Now, I've heard some people say that, oh, no, you know, you got to let the uh, actor see it and all that. Eh, yeah, yeah, I guess you should. Um, it does slow down the process somewhat. But let's, I don't know, fall on the side of safety. So that means, you know, clearing the gun, putting your finger through the chamber, shining a light. Through the thing so you can see that there's nothing in there obstructing it. That's one way to do it. But a tragedy nonetheless. And as I mentioned, it's really a story about union uh, uh, workers and a union being involved. Because the union is there for the sake, not just to get 
pay for the workers, but safety for the workers as well. Uh, reminds me of when uh, Captain Sully belly landed the the uh, airline carrier, airline jet, in the Hudson. And uh, one of the first things he talked about was the union having some say about how these things work. That they wouldn't have had some of the safety uh, warnings in the cockpit unless the union had been involved. And any number of things. Training was the big one. So I guess maybe 24-year-old armorers, whether they're the daughter or, or in the case of this AD, I don't know who, where, where he comes from, but he seems to get hired quite a bit. And uh, I don't know, maybe there should be a vetting. Maybe there should be a, a training period, an actual licensing to be a armorer. Apparently there's not one now. It's just experience. And I know everybody who handles guns will say, I know how to handle guns. I'm trained. Well, people shoot themselves in the leg all the time, pulling their gun out of Walmart. And then that round ricochets off and hits some three-year-old in the eye. Uh, you know, I mean, come on. Oh, that reminds me. There was a shooting in Boise at a mall. But it's okay. You know, in Idaho, everybody carries guns. So I wouldn't be too concerned about it. You know, when people die by gunfire instead of COVID, well, they're dying a natural death now, aren't they? At least in Idaho and other parts of the Northwest. Yes. Well, speaking of the, of the Northwest, we actually have a story here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. So why don't we go ahead and let you know what's going on in the, well, the curated part of the show. Because as I look at the time, oh my God, have we been ranting. I guess it's a rant. Well, starting off in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy at the top. The role of Facebook and the extremism it spread for profit on the January 6th insurrection is under scrutiny. As well it should. Then on the rest of the menu, two border agents were fired for white supremacist and racist Facebook posts. A union vote at Amazon's New York warehouse took a big step closer. And here's the Northwest connection. A Republican secretary of state who challenged Trump's false claims of election fraud is the front runner for a federal elections job. In the Biden administration. Joe, Joe knows how to play chess. Yes, three-dimensional. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with representatives of Myanmar's shadow government. I wonder who their de Gaulle is then. And the Biden administration suspended $700 million dollars in financial assistance to Sudan following a coup in the African nation yesterday. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room, of course, as you know, is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, though she be quite busy. Thank you, Kelly, for everything that you do. If you would look across uh, the page to the left near the bottom of our homepage at NetRootsRadio.com, yes, there is the link to our Patreon site. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of NetRoots Radio, it would help us tremendously. If you could send the amount of uh, what you would spend on an espresso-type coffee drink to us once a month, I'm telling you, that's going to help. 
and we have a lot of bills to pay, plus the machinery to keep this powerhouse of resistance resisting, as the founders originally intended, oh, so many years ago. All kidding aside, thank you for your generosity, and thank you for considering uh, some generosity in the future, because we're going to need it, (laughs) to be honest. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Busy as he be as well. Thank you, Tom, for everything that you do. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. As you know, or if you don't know already, I'm going to tell you. And if you do know already, I'm going to tell you anyway. (laughs) I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime because that's where the real reportage is the show notes and links. Okay. And then I try to get that linked up on Twitter and those other social media platforms. You know who they are. You can also follow the show on Twitter at cookbook West. And please, please, please pick up podcasts by way of speaker, stitcher, tune in. I heart YouTube, iTunes, really wherever podcasts can be found. Okay, wow, well, we're just burning up, burning up time. Better get into it here. Uh, this first offering uh, here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press. I'll say that again. The Associated Press by Elliot Spaggett. Two Border Patrol agents were fired from among 60 found to have committed misconduct for participating in a private Facebook group that mocked migrants and lawmakers, investigators said yesterday in the most detailed public account yet of an episode that tarnished the agency's reputation. As if letting little kids die in icebox baby gulags wasn't enough. But at least we have their mocking for the record. Most agents' penalties were significantly reduced from recommendations of an internal review board, according to the House Oversight and Reform Committee staff report. In the end, 43 others were suspended without pay, 12 got written reprimands, and 3 were disciplined in other ways, such as suspension with pay. Customs and Border Protection's Discipline Review Board proposed that 24 of the 60 agents be fired after news organizations reported on the group in July of 2019, but only two were. It investigated 135 allegations of misconduct. Oh my, you think there would be a little bit more uh, strenuous penalties involved here, but a Apparently, I guess not. One fired agent in Texas with 10 years in Border Patrol posted an image of Pepe the Frog, a symbol of alt-right and white supremacy, and doctored images of Joe Biden touching Ocasio-Cortez, the report said. The other California-based agent who was at the agency for 20 years and was disciplined in 2005 for undisclosed reasons, published homophobic memes and a doctored image of then-President Donald Trump raping a member of Congress. The report does not name the lawmaker, but Ocasio-Cortez has said she was depicted being raped on the Facebook group named I'm 1015. I'm 1015 which is Border Patrol code for migrants in custody, had about 9,500 current and former agency's members, including two agency chiefs, Carla Provost, who was chief from August 2010 until January 2020 after more than a year as acting head, joined in 2017 and told authorities that she used it to get an unfiltered gauge of reactions to her statements. Oh, my. Rodney Scott, who succeeded Provost until being forced out in August, said his membership enabled him to communicate with staff and know what the workforce is talking about. The workforce was talking about being fascist, you fascist. CBP's Office of Professional Responsibility, akin to a police department's internal affairs office, found insufficient evidence to discipline Provost or Scott, the report said. 
provost searched Facebook for I'm 1015 and was active on the social media site around the time of the offensive post, but did not contribute inappropriate content. Scott said he twice spotted questionable content involving migrants, but that it did not rise to the level of reportable misconduct. They were just making jokes. They were just being funny. House investigators said the images and content are antithetical to the CBP ethos and undermine the work carried out by dedicated CBP employees every day. Unfortunately, the agency failed to take adequate steps to prevent this conduct or impose consistent discipline on agents who engaged in it, creating a serious risk that this conduct could continue, investigators wrote. So I like how it was adjudicated that, oh, yeah, well, just get rid of the old guys. They were getting ready to retire anyway. And uh, everybody else is slap on the wrist, some with pay. Customs and Border Protection, which oversees the Border Patrol, said yesterday, Monday, that it is part of an internal department review ordered by Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to identify and terminate intolerable prejudice and to reform policies and training. CBP will not tolerate hateful, misogynist, or racist behavior or any conduct that is unbecoming of the honor we hold as public servants, the agency said in a statement. Bobby Kana Calvin of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. The National Labor Relations Board said there was sufficient interest to form a union at an Amazon distribution center in New York after union organizers yesterday, Monday, delivered hundreds of signatures to the agency, a key step in authorizing a vote they could establish the first union at the nation's largest online retailer. This is the second unionizing attempt in the past year at Amazon. Workers in Alabama resoundingly defeated an effort earlier this year, but organizers there are asking federal officials for a do-over since they were lied to. In this reporter's opinion, organizers delivered more than 2,000 signed union support cards to the NLR. NLRB's Brooklyn office after launching the effort in April. The specific number of signatures was not immediately available. This is a small victory, said Christian Smalls, a former employee of the retail giant who now leads the fledgling Amazon labor union, adding, we know the fight has just started. As part of its petition to hold a union vote, organizers must have submitted signatures from at least 30% from the roughly 5,500 employees who the union says work at four adjoining Amazon facilities that it seeks to represent under collective bargaining. Monday's development put the company on notice that the NLRB has determined that union organizers have met the minimum threshold for Amazon to formally acknowledge and to respond to the union organizing petition. That means... The company must post notices on its premises that the union is seeking to become the bargaining representative for thousands of Amazon workers on Staten Island. The company could have several avenues to challenge the effort, including contesting the number of, of employees that union organizers used to calculate the minimum signatures they needed. Amazon employees have complained about long work hours, insufficient breaks, and safety, with Smalls and others likening the working conditions to modern-day sweatshops. The employee turnover rate has also been a cause of concern. The union efforts on Staten Island come as Amazon is on a hiring binge. 
It announced in September it wants to hire 125,000 delivery and warehouse workers and is paying new recruits an average of $18 an hour in a tight job market. That's in addition to the 150,000 seasonal workers it plans to bring in for the holidays. Tucker from the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Republican Secretary of State who challenged Trump's false claims of election fraud in 2020 is the front runner for a job heading the Biden administration's effort to protect future elections, according to people familiar with the discussions. Kim Wyman, age 59, has led elections in Washington state for years, and she was reelected to a third term in November, the lone statewide elected Republican on the West Coast. She is in talks to serve as the election security leader for the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, and Infrastructure Security Agency, the agency responsible for safeguarding U.S. elections. The people who uh, had this knowledge of the dis- discussions but were not authorized to speak publicly and spoke to the AP on condition of anonymity. Wyman would serve as the government's liaison to the states, a job that was high profile before 2020 and will only be more so following Trump's false claims about the 2020 election he lost to Joe Biden and the and the embracing of those false claims by other members of the GOP. Trump and his allies made and still make false assertions that there was rampant election fraud in 2020, despite evidence to the contrary. And we know the story about it, how many lawsuits they've lost. Even Bill Barr said it was say, there was no fraud. Still, millions of Americans believe the 2020 election was stolen from Trump. That misinformation prompted thousands to storm the U.S. Capitol on January 6 in a violent but failed effort to stop the certification of Biden's win. That's a that's a fairly wordy uh, way of saying that it was an insurgency and they committed a coup. The discussions involving Wyman were first reported by CNN. The White House declined to comment, and the DHS did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Wyman did not respond to a text message yesterday, Monday, and her spokesman said they would not comment on the details of the story. She was a constant presence on national networks in the weeks leading up to the 2020 election, extolling the safety and security of the Vote by mail system in her state, a process in place there for years. She disputed Trump's claims that mail in voting was fraudulent because everybody knows you cannot hack paper ballots from afar. Wyman said she was an elections administrator first and foremost. If the president wants to rant and rave about how insecure vote by mail is or how our elections are going to be rigged, Then I'm going to talk about security measures that Washington State put in place, she told the AP in September of 2020. And I'm going to spend my time talking about the facts. And no, I am not going to get mired down in some sort of political debate and posturing. Well, well, well. That brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. 
You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Exactly 1,000 years ago, in the year 1021, a Viking or two or three likely wandered around the very northern tip of Newfoundland, cutting down trees. Clearing a particular spot or for get gathering wood that might have been used as timber for construction of some type, or for perhaps for boat repair. They were uh, very careful to obviously make sure their, their, their ships were uh, seaworthy. Michael D. is a geoscientist at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. He says it's not news that Vikings made it to North America around this time. Scientists and scholars have surmised as much from archaeological remains in Newfoundland and by scrutinizing ancient texts like the Icelandic sagas. One is not really sure how literal one can take the um, uh, Icelandic sagas. They contain a lot of not only inaccuracies, a lot of things that are obviously fantastical. Things like dead people speaking to them and so on. But now Dee and his colleagues have been able to come up with a precise date, the year 1021, based on evidence these Norse visitors left behind, specifically a stump, a log, and a branch. Wood anatomists have determined that certain surfaces of that wood must have been cut by metal blades. That's a Viking technology the local indigenous people are not known to have shared. And Dee's team was able to use a cosmic occurrence, an extraordinary shower of high-energy particles from space around the year 993 to date the felling of the trees. You see, that shower of cosmic rays created an abundance of radiocarbon. When taken up by the trees, it left a lasting signature in the tree rings, giving the scientists a key to pinpoint the year 993 in the three wood samples, using radiocarbon dating. And then you see all you have to do is count the rings from there to the edge. You have to know where the edge is, the bark edge, And then you'll know that was the last growth year of the the tree or the felling date of the tree. And it just so happened that in all three cases, that was exactly the same year, 1021 AD. The details are in the journal Nature. The year 1021 therefore marks the first time we know of that Europeans set foot in the Americas. But as the authors write, it also marks, quote, the earliest known year by which human migration had encircled the planet. Ever since moving out of Africa through Europe and Asia and across the Americas, nobody had got across uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, by this date, we know that the Atlantic Ocean was crossed for the first time. But as we know, it wouldn't be the last. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The discovery of penicillin in 1928 by Alexander Fleming was one of the greatest scientific achievements of the 20th century. It's hard to imagine a world before the development of what many consider to be miracle drugs. However, just 90 years ago, antibiotics weren't available. Thanks to antibiotics, some common illnesses such as strep throat are now easily treated, whereas in the past they often led to serious complications. Antibiotics serve an important role in keeping you and your loved ones healthy, but it's important to remember that antibiotics only treat bacterial infections. Most common infections such as colds, flu, most sore throats, bronchitis, and many sinus and ear infections are caused by viruses and do not respond to antibiotic treatment. These infections can be overcome by simply treating the symptoms and letting the illness run its course. Unfortunately, Antibiotics have often been overused, resulting in decreased effectiveness and an increase in antibiotic-resistant diseases. Antibiotic resistance, or the increased ability of bacteria to survive in the presence of antibiotics, has become a major public health threat that we all need to help fight. When a person takes antibiotics, they are at risk for possibly having a bad reaction to these drugs. Some side effects can be quite serious or even life-threatening in the case of an allergic reaction or severe diarrhea. 
This is why it is very important to only use antibiotics when they are absolutely needed and not for viral infections. Talk to your healthcare professional about the best treatment for your illness. If it is caused by a virus, follow his or her recommendation for treating the symptoms. Learn more about appropriate antibiotic use and how to feel better when you don't need an antibiotic by visiting CDC's Get Smart Know When Antibiotics Work website at cdc.gov slash get smart slash community. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. If you're a corporate employee, you know that something unpleasant is afoot when top executives are suddenly issuing statements about how committed they are to their employees making sure that all of them are treated with dignity and respect. For example, the PR chief of a global outfit named Teleperformance, one of the world's largest call centers, was recently going on and on about how, quote, we value our people and their well-being, safety, and happiness. Why did the corporation feel such a desperate need to proclaim its virtue? Because it's been caught in a nasty scheme to spy on its own workers. Teleperformance, a $6.7 billion global behemoth that handles customer service calls for Amazon, Apple, Uber, etc., saves money on overhead by making most of its 380,000 employees around the world work from their own homes. That can be a convenience for many workers, but a new corporate policy first imposed in March on thousands of its workers in Colombia is an Orwellian nightmare. Teleperformance is pressuring them to sign an eight-page addendum to their employee contracts, allowing corporate-controlled video cameras, electronic audio devices, and data collection tools to be put in their homes to monitor their actions. I work in my bedroom, one employee noted. I don't want to have a camera in my bedroom. Neither would I, and I doubt that Teleperformance's $20 million a year CEO would allow one in his mansion. Uglier yet, the privacy-obliterating contract requires that even the children of employees can be spied on at home. Nonetheless, the Colombian worker signed because her supervisor said she could lose her job if she refused. Of course, Teleperformance Inc. assures us that the data it collects on children is not shared elsewhere. But how do we know that? Trust us, they say. This is Jim Hightower saying, do you? Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1837. That was the day that Louisa Lee Schuyler was born in New York City. She was dedicated to the causes of public health and welfare, especially for the poor. This led her to help found the Bellevue Training School for Nurses in 1873. It was the first nurses' school in the United States based on the principles of Florence Nightingale, the English social reformer who established modern nursing practices. Louisa had become concerned with the conditions found at the city's public hospitals. Along with three other women, she toured Bellevue Hospital, finding poor lighting, dire sanitary conditions, and even a laundry that had run out of soap. 
the women wrote up a report about their findings. They made the case that a professionally trained nursing staff would help remedy the situation. The work of women during the Civil War had shown the potentially important role of nurses in providing medical care. The women's request was approved on a trial basis at Bellevue. Bellevue Hospital had opened its doors in 1736, making it the oldest continually running public hospital in the United States. The first class of nurses included just six women. Early training focused on improving sanitary conditions at the hospital and seeing to patient comfort. But instruction grew quickly to include basic medical training. By 1879, enrollment had grown to more than 60 trainees. Proud of their accomplishments, graduates wore a school pin. Designed by Tiffany and Company, the pin portrayed a crane in the middle of a wreath of poppies. The school operated for nearly a century until the training program was incorporated into Hunter College. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 47 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of only about 58 with a steady light rain this morning. Showers continuing later this morning into the afternoon. Winds light and variable, and it looks like we're going to have, oh, something less than a quarter of an inch, which is still quite a bit. Cloudy with showers overnight, lows about 49 to 50, winds light and variable, and uh, looks like maybe a tenth of an inch of rain on that forecast. And partly to mostly cloudy tomorrow with highs in the mid-60s, winds light and variable. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County have still not been updated from the weekend and should be updated after showtime today, like right now. And we now continue to stand, as we have since Friday, at 231,065 confirmed cases with 310 confirmed deceased. Ragweed pollen is rated moderate right outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 30 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is low at 2. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.93 inches. Visibility is down to 4 miles, and relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 62 and cloudy. Paris is 60 degrees and cloudy. Rome is 63 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 48 and fair. Kabul is 48 and clear. Hong Kong is 75 degrees and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 60 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 65 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 55 and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 62 degrees Fahrenheit and it's raining. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met yesterday, Monday, with representatives of Myanmar's national unity government set up by opponents of army rule, the White House said late yesterday, Monday. In the virtual meeting, Sullivan reiterated continued U.S. support for the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar and discussed ongoing efforts to restore the country's path to democracy with the government's representatives Duwa Lashi, La Dewey Lashi Law, and Zinmar Ong, the White House said in a statement. Sullivan expressed concern over the military's violence and said the U.S. will continue to promote accountability for the coup, according to the White House. Protests and unrest have paralyzed Myanmar since the February 1 coup, with the military accused of atrocities and excessive force against civilians. The junta blames the unrest on terrorists allied with the shadow government. Recognizing Myanmar's junta as the country's government would not stop growing violence, the outgoing United Nations Special Envoy on Myanmar said earlier yesterday. Sullivan expressed particular concern over the recent arrest of pro-democracy activist Ko Jimmy and noted the U.S. will continue to advocate for his release, according to the statement. Sullivan and the shadow government officials also discussed the COVID-19 pandemic in Myanmar and ongoing U.S. efforts to provide humanitarian assistance directly to the people of Myanmar. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Matthew Lee of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Biden administration yesterday, Monday, suspended $700 million in financial assistance to the Sudan following a coup in the African nation that U.S. officials roundly condemned. The State Department said the full amount of the age package had been put on pause pending a review of the developments in Khartoum that saw the military oust a civilian-led transitional authority and detain many of its members. Spokesman Ned Price called the for the immediate release of those arrested, including Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok and the restoration of the civilian authority. The civilian-led transitional government should be immediately restored. It represents the will of the Sudanese people, as evidenced by the significant, peaceful demonstrations of support, Price said. We recognize the legitimate grievances about the pace of the transition, but the dismissal of government officials and dissolution of government institutions both violate Sudan's constitutional declaration and abandon the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people. Military officials should immediately release and ensure the safety of all detained, uh, fully restore the civilian-led transitional government, and refrain from any violence against protesters, including the use of live ammunition, Price said. Any change to the transitional government by force risks assistance and our bilateral relationship more broadly. The suspended aid was direct financial support intended to help the country transition to a fully civilian government. Price said additional U.S. aid to the country could also be at risk with the broader relation, along with the broader relationship. Ties between Washington and Khartoum had been warming since Sudan agreed to pay compensation to the victims of the 1998 embassy bombings in neighboring Kenya and nearby Tanzania that were planned on Sudanese soil by bin Laden's al-Qaeda network. 
Sudan had been removed from the U.S. list of state sponsors of terrorism late last year. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know, of course, that Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver